So I want you all to imagine, imagine that moment for Joseph when, you know what, his brothers just appeared right in front of him, dropped right back into his life. I mean, years before they had sold him into slavery, they had lied to Jacob, their father, and told him that Joseph had been killed by a wild beast. And because of his brother's jealous plot, Joseph had lost his beloved father, his home, and everything that he knew. Now, I'm sure that Joseph must have nursed years of feelings of anger, of betrayal, of yearning for the justice that he was owed for the way he was so cruelly betrayed. And I'm sure that he spent plenty of time playing out what he would do if he ever saw his brothers again, you know, running through that monologue in his mind of what his, he would say. And here they were right in front of him. And you know what? They didn't even recognize him. I mean, what a sense of power and triumph Joseph must have within him to be able to just spring his true identity on them and then watch as his brothers, well, you know, they're going to squirm, right? I mean, how uncomfortable for them to realize that Pharaoh's steward, the one to whom they came to beg mercy and food and shelter during this terrible, terrible drought, is the very same brother that they had so cruelly wronged. I mean, the poetic justice. It's incredible in this story, isn't it? I mean, the moment is potent with it. Joseph held the power of life and death over them and over his entire family. And you know what? What they did to him, for that, he should just send them away empty-handed. And how he must have yearned to just rage at them about all the pain and the despair that he had suffered at the hands of their betrayal. But <coughs> did we hear that correctly? Because that's not what happens. Joseph says to them instead, <coughs> do not be distressed. Do not be angry because with yourselves because you sold me here. I mean, it's, it's impossible to believe almost because Joseph actually forgives his brothers. He loads them up with food. He gives them gifts and treasures. And he invites them to bring back their father and to come live with him in Egypt. I mean, it's incredible. I'm sure all of you are thinking, this is why this is scripture and we're in real life. I mean, you know, it's easy to be cynical. That's just not the way the world works 99% of the time. Because of course, the world that we look at, I mean, we fight back, tit for tat, we even up the score. And you know what, if we didn't, people just walk all over us, right? There have to be consequences for bad behavior and we have to defend ourselves. Plus, you know what, revenge, it is so, so sweet. <laughs> so, it's for this very reason that Jesus's words in today's gospel kind of hit us as this particularly bitter pill, don't you think? I mean, Jesus says to us without any reservations, do not do it this way. None of that tit for tat and revenge stuff that I know you were all thinking about because Jesus knows us, right? <laughs> Jesus's statement is just as startling as Joseph's was. Jesus says, love your enemies. I mean, that's illogical. That's not even what enemies means. It goes against the very nature of what that relationship of enemy to enemy should be. So what's Jesus mean? I mean, given that all of those examples 
that Jesus gives us, bless, offer the other cheek, do good, pray for your enemy. Those are actions. Those are things to do. So Jesus isn't talking about an emotional kind of love here. If we look closely, we can see that the Greek word that Jesus uses is agape. And I'm told that that's a type of love that refers to social or moral obligations between people. It encompasses all of the mutuality between members of extended families and villages in Jesus's time. It talks about, you know, you, you feed them when they come and you offer and help them and you know exactly who fits in which box and to whom you owe these kinds of agape obligations. It was kind of like the social safety net of Jesus's time. It, it was a glue and it held together all of the small communities in the ancient Near East at that time. Because you knew who your people were, you took care of your own, and you didn't have to worry about everyone else because everybody had their little spheres in whom they did this taking care. However, Jesus is asking for something different. Jesus is saying, love your enemies, agape your enemies. In other words, Jesus is breaking open that whole idea in his society and that you just keep that to your own. I mean, how could you treat someone like family or neighbor to whom you are so wholly unaffiliated that you call them an enemy? I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense any more than it makes sense to us. There's this one commentator who said, we are not only to forsake punishment, we are being asked to seek our enemies' good and to respond to their need. Now, we're all adults in this room, right? So I think that we understand the emotional challenges of not responding in anger when we're provoked. We understand what it means to overcome hatred and to forgive those who have wronged us. But for a society that was grounded in these finely tuned senses of balance, reciprocal obligations, I give you this and you give me that and you know who owes who what, Jesus' suggestion, well, it almost feels like a recipe for chaos. So what was Jesus up to? Well, if we return to Joseph's story with his brothers, we can find a little clue. You see, Joseph also had a right to demand recompense under this sense of mutual obligation because his brothers had so egregiously broken their family obligations to Joseph. And you know what? His brothers, they knew it. They knew that this is what they owed back to Joseph. His brothers could hardly expect to be treated like family again and yet that's exactly what Joseph does. He meets their immediate needs. He gives them food, he gives them shelter, and he offers them a place to stay during this famine. And then he goes even beyond that because he showers them with the celebration of gifts and treasure and welcome. How can Joseph find a way to overcome all of the dictates of his society and his own sense of spite and anger? I think it's only because Joseph felt God's hand all along the way from that moment that he was abandoned out in the desert. He felt God's hand with him, blessing him with fortune and favor as he made his way into Egypt and made that connection and found a new place and a new life. He had lost his family, but he had God with them, and God carried him into something new. That's what he tells his brothers. That's what the source of his compassion is for them. Because after what they had done, they neither expected nor deserved that kind of love, and they knew it. But Joseph's surprising actions changed everything between them. 
Joseph reshaped what should have been anger and hatred and retribution into reconciliation and a new sense of peace and love and family between them and actually between two peoples. This was a powerful act of love and it transformed everything. It was not an act of weakness. Joseph did not let his brothers walk all over him and their gratitude probably begat a relationship of incredible strength and loyalty from that day forward. So that traditional thing, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it's a natural thing and it feels somehow just to us. It feels reciprocal, but you know what? Lots of people over time, over all the millennia that we human beings have acted this way, have pointed out that the other thing that it begets is a people who are blind and toothless. It doesn't really serve us well in the long run. The great mystery that Jesus points to is that breaking that entire cycle of reciprocal retribution, in fact, creates a new form of reciprocal love. Now, we have seen both the impossibility and also the miraculous possibilities of this transformation play out at different times in our own world today. I mean, contrast what's going on between Russia and Ukraine right now. Generations of aggression, tension, violence. It feels like we've heard this story before and it just keeps coming back over and over and over again. It's awful, it's terrible to watch and it feels like it's out of our control. Now contrast that to the amazing comparative peace and reconciliation that leaders like Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu somehow managed to forge through hard work, a lot of public coming to, bringing everything to the table to overturn what was a century of both racial and inter-tribal warfare. I read about a man whose wife had been murdered and after years and years of struggle, and grief and hatred and bitterness that he had nursed inside him. He finally came to a point where he was able to forgive the person who had murdered his wife. He was asked to tell his story to a 16 year old refugee who had escaped atrocities in Bosnia. Her immediate response was, a man kills your wife and you forgive that man? Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand how that's possible. But then tears ran down her cheeks because she also told him that she hoped that someday she could also find a way to forgive the Serbs that had been so awful and cruelly killed so many of her people. To this, the man replied, honey, you have to try. It's the only way to find healing from this entire rotten mess. I think that Martin Luther King Jr., when preaching on this very gospel, put it best. Far from the pious injunction of utopian dreamer, this command to love your enemy is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization, because love is the only creative, redemptive, and transforming power in the universe. Isn't this exactly what God does for us in Jesus? I'm sure all of you are thinking, right? Because you know what? Jesus knows what it means to love our enemy. And he knows that it's more than just some sort of social oxymoron. He knows that it's the only way that we could ever hope to find the strength to turn our own deep and bitter hatreds into forgiveness and love for our enemies. The only way that we're going to be able to do that is because we feel the very grace of Jesus' gift to us every day of our lives. Jesus tells us, be merciful just as your father's merciful. We've experienced this love from God. 
We can love our enemies only because God did it for us first. In the words of Phyllis Kirsten, God pulled a paradigm shift on the cross. God settled the whole world's old scores right then and right there. God tore up every ledger. So if the loving one's enemy is at the core of what God and Jesus Christ did for us, it's not just good ethics or a great strategy for a more peaceful planet. It is, in fact, participation in Christ's very own mission to reshape the whole of creation into God's kingdom. Loving our enemy is saying we trust in God's grace. We can do it only because we have experienced it. We have been made children of the Most High. When we do that, when we act in reconciliation and peace and love our enemies, it's God's own love that just pours through us. So how do we respond to words that we hear today and this kind of challenge in our lives? I mean, what can we do? How can we wage, wage reconciliation and healing in a world that is so incredibly full of these giant conflicts and these huge enmities? I mean, I'm in awe of those who have that gift of brokering international peace or the activists who are out there challenging senseless violence and fostering change. I admire all those people who can creatively build bridges of understanding across long-standing barriers of culture, religion, and nation. I mean, that kind of love in the face of so much hatred in our world, that's God at work. You can see it, you can smell it, you can taste it, and you know it. But the thing is, if you're like me, that just seems huge and overwhelming and just honestly, out of my league. So where do you start? Well, we can start by looking inside ourselves and asking who would be the hardest person for me to pray for? Who would be the hardest person for me to offer a blessing to or to do something good for? And then we just start doing it love our own enemies in our own lives and find ways to build new connections that are based in reconciliation and peace in the little relationships that are part of our own community. I'm gonna to close today with the words of Thomas Merton who sums it up just like this. We who are often ungrateful and wicked ourselves, but who receive God's mercy and love now see in the face of our own enemy, the very face of God. Amen. Amen.